recording. What's up, guys? Uh, I am Drew with Comics Elite, here with Kyle, not Kevin. And today, we have with us uh, someone who has held, at one point or another in his career, the positions of writer, editor, editor-in-chief, publisher, chief creative officer, and has written practically every character from Archie to Arnim Zola, uh, writer of seminal works such as Kingdom Come, Superman Birthright, JLA Tower of Babel, The Flash, Return of Barry Allen, Captain America, Operation Rebirth, and Irredeemable. The one and only Mark Wade. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. And you left off your list. You left off uh, penciler, colorist, letterer, and store owner. So, and yeah, and publisher. So there's, other than put the staples in the comics, I've done literally everything there is to do. It's, it, that was actually going to be my follow-up question. Is there any position you have not no. done yet? I mean, they're really, I mean, no kidding. There really isn't. That's one of the reasons I wanted to be a store owner is because it's the only thing I hadn't done yet. So <laughs> that's awesome. So, um, Kyle and I, we're relatively new into comic book writing and, mm -hmm. uh, we, uh, for, I'm curious for you about how much control or input do you have on what you've written to the page, to the art? Does it all depend on the project or are you just trusting the artist at this point? Has it changed? It, depend, it depends on the project. It depends on the artist. I mean, it, it it's first off, it's a collaborative medium, <clears throat> and some that's something you've got to always bear in mind. Excuse me for a sec. <clears throat> it is a collaborative medium. Oh man, can I still got a frog? Hang on. <clears throat> it, I'm fighting a cold too, hey. so I'm I'm fighting. I'll be coughing at some point or another too. That's right. Okay, so it it's still there. <laughs> it, <laughs> so we're just gonna have to live with it. Uh, the vocal fry. Um, it, it is. I always say it's my story until such time as I give it to the artist, at which point it's our story, right? It's, they're not there to be an art robot. They're not there to strictly follow my panel descriptions, not deviate and don't do anything different. It's a collaborative medium. And if, it, if I could do what they do, then I wouldn't need them, you know? So, and I can't do what they do. Let them do their job well. So, you know, you, you, always make sure you keep a line of communication open, whether that's by email or text or phone. Uh, you encourage the artist to call you or contact you if there's questions, if there's ideas, if there's ways of doing things that they think might be more interesting, always be willing to have those conversations. And try to be mindful of the fact that what takes me, you know, an hour, a page that takes me maybe an hour to write, takes them a day to draw. And so being mindful of their time is important too. So my rule of thumb is always, okay, if, it, if it's not quite what I was looking for, but I can fix it in the dialogue, let's just fix it in the dialogue rather than ask for a redraw. Um, on the other hand, if it's just, you know, missing import, an important story element or something, not, not talking about somebody's position on the page or the angle on this or whatever, but I mean, if there's some important part of storytelling that is missing from that panel or that page, then it's okay to make a call and just, you know, be, don't be a dictator. Just, you know, explain why you're, what your concerns are and see if you can get the, the artist on your side. Um, I'm lucky enough to be working with artists who do breakdowns and thumbnails and roughs first and send them to editorial and to me just to make sure that we're all on the same page, literally, uh, before <laughs> they do the big, you know, deep dive penciling job, which I think is really smart. And there's been times when, you know, Dan Morrow will send me layouts and they're always great they're always brilliant but i'll look at them and go actually you know i need that thing in this panel if that's okay or would you mind you know i i can see that the ballooning is going to be weird if these if the panel is laid out this way could we maybe do this and he's always gracious you know so are you experiencing now because i mean you're a real, you're a seasoned writer at this point your name is yeah. very well known <laughs> um you've been around a couple years uh, -huh. uh so do artists get like this get to a state when they're oh my god i'm drawing for mark wade you know i should really do what he has to say like yes sir yeah. like uh no problem i don't i doubt that i don't know and even <laughs> it's true I, you know what even if it's true let somebody else say it i don't know i <laughs> i never feel that way i mean i think that that's the easiest way to become a jerk is to just mm -hmm. think that somehow because you've been doing this for a long time that you know you're your word is law and you were above question and that, you know, you're going to take advantage of the fact that you've been around so long to intimidate other people. That's, just, that's crap. That's baloney. That's how you end up not working. Okay. Fair, 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 fair. 
Uh, you want to ask the next yeah, question? Yeah, so speaking of that, you've been away from D.C. for a, a little bit now. What's mm-hmm. the experience been like coming back to it's D.C.? It's been great. It's been amazing. It's been everything I could hope for. It has been everything I could hope for. I got, you know, the the day the doors opened again, uh, I got four calls from D.C. Wow. editors that day, two of them before lunch. And <laughs> it was, you know, please come home. And, <laughs> They just threw open the doors. What do you want to do? Well, I'd like to do this. Okay, do that. Well, what about this? Well, no, you can do that too. And, you know, they haven't said no to me yet on anything. And it's been a chance to do the, do the stories that you would have seen 10 years ago if, you know, if things have been different. Um, and if there'd been a market for them at DC at the time. I just, I love it. I love being back here and I love being able to play with these toys that mean so much to me. Mm-hmm. And I would agree because right now uh, we, as well as most other comic book reviewers we we talk to, we would agree that World's Finest is arguably the best title at DC right now. I mean, you, you. yeah, it, it really is. It truly is. Uh, every issue has been fantastic. We read and review every single new comic, and from Jump Street, it's been fantastic. Thank uh, you. What's the reception been like from your point of view, and what's it been like collaborating with Dan Mora? It's been unbelievable from my point of view because this – and this answers your second question too, working with Dan Mora is the key. There is a world in which we gave that book to a solid B-level artist or an up and comer who didn't really love the characters, but wanted the gig and nobody would be care and no one would care. And it would feel like a nostalgia act. And that was my mandate to my editors and to Dan, like do not, help me do not make this look like a nostalgia act don't make this look like you know i i don't want to name names you know (laughs) older creator doing the thing that they did 30 years ago and hoping you still love it um don't be that way and dan's been you know has has raised that bar i mean he just every single page every single time it just looks contemporary and fresh and new and even if it's set you know, the book is set a few years in, in DC's past continuity. He makes it look like it's happening now. I mean, it's just great. Yeah. His, I, I, I specifically, I loved issue two with the doom patrol. That was awesome. Mm-hmm. I terrifically loved that. Great the old school doom patrol, Thanks. but um, so transitioning back to before you return to DC, mm-hmm. you're with humanoid. You're with humanoids as the publisher. Yeah. Uh, how was that role compared to the others for you when you were a publisher? It, it, it was crazily different, but, we were in the pandemic time. I mean, that was it. I literally, I took the job as publisher on a Monday. Uh, and I said to the staff, my hand to God, I said, like Icarus flying toward the sun. I said, listen, I've seen every problem there is to see in comics. In fact, I kind of look forward to you showing me a problem I've never seen before. Mm -hmm. Next day we lose a third of our back stock in a tornado accident. The day after that, you know, one of our key staffers, uh, announces that she's been planning on quitting for a while. Uh, the day after that, we shut the world down. Yeah. And so, <laughs> I, you know, I stayed on for a couple of years as publisher. Um, I made an exit earlier this year, very amicable. I mean, it just, it, it was never a full-time job for me. It was always meant to be like, you know, I can do like 30 hours a week, but I've got other commitments, other stuff. And they have grown to a point where I recognized, and I came to them and said, look, you need somebody who can make this their first and only priority in their main mission. And so I stepped away and they have not collapsed in my absence, which is good. Uh, Not that I expected them to. Um, And, and you know, it was, it was, it was an interesting two years. It's a lot to try to learn on the job when you're not in the office with people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my learning curve was a lot longer and slower than it would have been had I been in the offices. But, you know, we did some good stuff. I mean, I think we really published a lot of good stuff during that time. And there's stuff that's still coming out for the next year or so that's going to have my name on it that I'm proud of, including the Incal sequels by Unique Paquette and Mark Russell, which I think looks amazing. Um, there's other stuff that's coming out. So it was, good, you know, it's a long answer to a short question, but it was a good. It was a good time. And uh, yeah, so speaking of humanoids, uh, all of us here at Comics Elite, Sean isn't here, the owner, to say this, but we're all we were all big fans of Space Bastards. Yeah, we we, we, we love this series, and we still laugh to this day at how funny, over the top, and unpredictable it was. Yeah, uh, so much so like we had to do an, a New York Comic Con exclusive for it. 
Yeah. Uh, what are your thoughts on that series and the creators? Of oh, it's great. I mean, the first of the creators are so easy to work with. I mean, they're, they're flexible, they're funny, they're, you know, they're humble. Uh, they're, they're terrific. And I've never had any issues with them. Uh, it was a lot of fun to work with them. I think the book is, you know, raunchy and raucous and, you know, I, Lobo crossed with, you know, yeah. Han Solo. Yeah. It, that's kind of what it, the tone of the book. And it's a lot of fun. And I know it's, you know, it's not for everybody, no. but for those it's for, <laughs> they're really digging it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We dug every single issue. Oh, yeah. Oh, we, did, we, we, it was the, the one book I remember I was looking forward to every week it came out is I always saved the best for last. And that was always my last book I was going to read to the, 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 the capper of the week and never disappointed. I never. Yeah, never. Yeah. What else yeah. So moving on. So congrats on your success with the boom Kickstarter for irredeemable. Thank um, you, Kevin. Yeah. So what was the return to that world like for you? Um, it, it we're still in the reentry phase. Okay, um, okay. to some degree. So, you know, we don't go to the store next month and look for irredeemable number one. I mean, it's going to be a little <laughs> while before it'll be 2000, you know, 23 before we get into really relaunching it, but we've already been working on it and thinking about it, Pete Krause and I, and it's been fun. We found some ways to do it in a way that doesn't, you know, is, that is a continuation of that story rather than just the, un, like an untold chapter that you didn't know before uh, and some ways to make it surprising. Uh, Boom did a phenomenal job with that Kickstarter and yeah. I can't believe it hit the levels it did, but those books are going to be amazing looking. It's going to be so nice after all these years to have all of that material in nice hardcover omnibus editions. I can't wait. Yeah, that's I remember because I was reading them when they came out, and I was really always hoping for an omnibus size of them because I was always having to try to find the trades, right. get them all collected. I, I hate having several trades. Can I just get one big book, please? It's really the big book. But uh, yeah, I'm I can't wait to get my copy. I'm looking forward to it because I was reading that all the time, and I loved Insufferable. I really loved Insufferable. That was my favorite one. Thank you. Thank but, you. Um, uh, so speaking of uh, the irredeemable universe, do you do you ever get like irked or annoyed when someone says? Injustice is so original and injustice is so cool. And do you think to yourself, hey, I did that years before <laughs> injustice? I'm you know what? It's it's you know what the boys has done it and you know Brightburn has done it and it's you know it's I don't get annoyed because it is low it's low hanging fruit. The the basic concept of what if Superman snapped and went nuts, yeah, mm -hmm. that's low hanging fruit. Mm -hmm. Anyone can tell that story. Yeah. I think what sets irredeemable apart, I think, is that that's the beginning and but the rest it's more about a story about grief it's a story about exploring how people deal with power it's a it's an it's a big it's a it's a big story about not just hey what if superman went nuts but what if you had these abilities and you didn't have the emotional makeup to use them well what would that life what would your life be like why would you come to a point where you snapped you know, it's not played for goofy laughs. It's, no. No, you know, no. there's a, it's really like deep <clears throat> psychological stuff. Like what, what would drive someone crazy to that point? And to me, that's what makes that book stand out. I hope. Yeah, well, it really does. And yeah, every issue you don't, I really, that's another one. I did not know what to expect with the, you know, who's going to be, who's going to, who could be killed next, which was great about it. And um, so uh, years ago, I had met you in Indianapolis, and uh, when I had when I had you sign my Superman Birthright hardcover, mm -hmm. I remember you had said to me, "This was my most favorite project." Yep. And then earlier this year, I had actually met Lionel Francis Yu, and mm -hmm. I had him sign my hardcover for it as well. And he said the exact no same really? thing, the exact <laughs> same thing. And so I wonder what what makes what makes it your most favorite project, and why do you think Lionel said that as well? I'm stunned that Lionel's, I mean, I'm, gl I'm glad I'm not, I'm not like surprised. Like, <laughs> I hate it, but that's really nice to hear because, you know, I handpicked him for that book because we had the choice of several different artists, but a, I loved his work. I remember the first time I saw his work, I was in the X-Men offices just, you know, hanging out and I saw his work and I remember I called him. He like, this is his very first work. And I said, look, you and I are going to work together someday. This is great. And years later when the opportunity came, we had a choice of uh, several different artists and what set Lanil apart besides the fact that he's great was that he was the only one who hadn't drawn Superman before. 
Mm. And we wanted to show you a Superman that you had never seen before. Yeah. So, I mean, what makes that my favorite project? It's just my love letter to Superman. It's my favorite character. It's, it's all the things I, it, it's not all the things. It's a lot of the things I wanted to say about the character. And given the opportunity as I was to show you why I think Superman is cool, the greatest compliment I get is not, I really like that story or I like this moment, I like that moment. The greatest compliment I get when people come up with it for signing is, I didn't really like Superman until I read this. That makes me feel like I did my job. Very nice. Wow. Who were the other artists? <laughs> Can't tell. I don't want to tell. Ah, <laughs> dang it. <laughs> yeah. My, my favorite my favorite moment in the series, uh, I, still, I, I remember almost every single page. Mine was when uh, Clark, he's at a diner across the street, and he's watching the, peop, the, the staff from the, oh, da from, yeah. the, from the Daily Planet. They're all yeah. having fun, you know, poking, making, making jokes about him. I'm like, it was just a, such a heartbreaking moment. Thank you. Reading that. Yeah, that was, I mean, that was probably my favorite moment of that series. Yeah. I mean, if you're, this is the thing that is easy to overlook about Superman is that he's got to be like the loneliest man on the planet. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, if you take Supergirl and some of this other stuff out of the equation and you, you get back to early Superman like this was, you know, this, this is Superman just finding his way in the world for the first time he just sees things and hears things and perceives things in ways that nobody else in the world can. And there's no one to share that with. He sees colors that, that have no names because there's no point in looking up a name because n no one else can see it. Um, and so the loneliness that creates in you uh, is something that I think is a very important part of Superman. And so Clark being his metropolis self, his metropolis face, but, still not being able to do much with that as Clark. He can't be everybody's buddy and everybody's chum and, and the most popular guy in the office because again, then people are looking at him. That's mm -hmm. the problem with being Clark is that, you know, Clark doesn't need to be bumbly, cartoony like Christopher Reeve's Superman, he, but he doesn't need to be, you know, like a strong jawed, lantern jawed, you know, two-fisted reporter either. To me, Clark is the guy in the office that you just don't think about much, you know? The, 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 you know, the, I think the point in the scene that I said to you was that, yeah. or, or the point that you said to me, yeah. sorry, yeah. it's been a long day. Yeah. Um, yeah. The point of that scene was that, was that nobody had thought to invite Clark to this after work gathering. They just hadn't thought to because they don't think about Clark. Yeah. Mm. It's true. Fair. Uh, so uh, next, this upcoming week, you have uh, Batman versus Robin coming out yeah. right here. Yeah. Uh, we we've read it. We've already yeah. read it, and it's jaw dropping. Thank Safe you. to say, it's my pick of the week. Thank uh, you. Yes. Uh, what's that project been like for you? Oh, it's been great. I mean, this is I haven't done long form Batman ever. I've done you know Justice League, and I've done a couple of one shots here and there, but it's my first run at doing a long form Batman story. And I pitched it a, a year and a half ago. I pitched it you know when when I first came back and said I want to do Batman versus Robin. It was basically just to that point like a four four issues, twenty two pages each, and that was the self contained story. But the more we talked about it, the more possibilities we saw, and the more it could tie in with some of the other things that are happening in the DC universe this year. Uh, it just became bigger and bigger and bigger, and it's a blast. I mean, just sitting down and going through all of the magical characters in the DC universe, yeah. <laughs> and giving you some hopefully some new take on this character or that character mm -hmm. you know and, and and putting batman in a world i mean the, the, you know the, the hook of the book obviously is that it's batman versus damien yeah mm -hmm. and the problem that batman has is that damien knows every trick every <laughs> tool every <laughs> resource every fighting method he knows everything that bruce has up his sleeve everything yeah so he's got so bruce has to enter a world of magic, which he doesn't want to enter, and he's not comfortable there, but that's the only place that he might be able to, to get through to Damien, you know, be able to make an end run around Damien, because otherwise, you know, Damien's got his number. Yeah, and mm -hmm. there's actually, there's some pretty stunning visuals oh, in, yeah. in this book, specifically with a certain magician. I'm like, yeah. I was like whoa! Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, so when, I'm, I'm, you probably know the page I'm talking about, the certain yeah. magician, later, on, later, later half of the book. Uh -huh. uh, were there any like pushback like whoa how did no. this happen no? no nobody nobody you know nobody ever said not too far i will <laughs> say this about that page that won't make sense to anybody until next week but yeah 
you know, Zatanna's letters coming to life. Okay. <laughs> and did that come across on the page that it was actually literally the letters of her spell literally coming to life and hanging in front of her? Interesting. Uh, I hadn't. I really wanted to come yeah. across. Didn't really come across. Okay. Well, if you for, look at this, other, other people got it, but I, I have yeah. to reread it again. If you look at the spell, if you look at the spell she she okay. cast, the the letters of that spell really mm -hmm. literally come to life and reform to spell out something else. And coming up with an incantation mm -hmm. that made sense mm -hmm. and used all those letters took me six hours. That was the longest I, I spent on doing anything in this book. I'm hoping people are watching this because there may there may be others who probably won't pick up on that. But uh, now we have. So yes. I'm after we're done here, I'm going to be looking that up. I'm going to go back and look at that. Wow, I had <laughs> no clue. That's that is good to know. It's great to but, know. But yeah, uh, I had a blast reading it. It was fantastic. Nice. Art, art is terrific. Pacing is terrific. Fight scenes is great scene. I mean, the, it, they've already shown in the preview preview images. Alfred's back. Whoa! Yeah. Holy crap! That's great. Yep. I love it. Yeah. Is uh, it? Yeah. Is it? <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> Is uh, it great? <laughs> so for you, I mean, you've been doing this for, like you said, a couple of years now. Uh, who's been the easiest care? Who've been the easiest characters for you to write, and who've been the, the most difficult for you to Good write? Question. The, all of the magical characters have it. I have a difficult time with. Uh, mm -hmm. Not not an impossible time, but I just don't. I've always been a science character. I've always been like a or science you know, reader, I've always been, I've always leaned toward the scientific characters yeah. and I've never really spent a lot of time with DC's man. I know the magical characters, but I never really spent a lot of time in that world thinking about that. So they all take a great deal of research and reading and just making sure those voices are consistent and their characterizations are what they, you know, are consistent with what we've seen. Those are the hardest ones, but writing Damien is like falling off a log because he's <laughs> such when he's in this state, and I'm not giving anything away by saying he's possessed by something, yeah, um, that comes out of world's finest. Um, mm -hmm. Yep. So writing him with being able to write the snide, you know, callow, you know, jerk, yeah, Damien yeah. that that Grant originally introduced all those years ago. Yeah. That voice is just that voice just comes out like nothing. That's great. That's per, and that's, that's who he, he's just he's, yes. he's an insufferable little shit. That's what's great and, about and writing him that way is so much fun. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, speaking of that, you talk about the scientific characters you can relate you can relate to. Um, yeah. I, I'm a big fan of your Flash Run, and uh, mm -hmm. the, the first story of yours I ever read was uh, the Return of Barry Allen, and to this day yeah. it still blows my mind. And I recommend everyone if they're going to read the Flash, I tell them to read Return of Barry Allen. Um, which which Flash character would you say you most relate to? Well, oh, hands down. I mean, Wally was just, Wally. it was my voice. It was my personality. I basically just Mary sued that thing straight up. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. So I was always curious because Max Mercury is my guy. I always love Max Mercury. I love, and, I'm, uh, I'm glad to hear it. Yeah, love you reintroducing him. It was terrific. Uh, yeah. Sorry, fanboy moment for there for a second. Um, the, All place? right. So you've been an editor before. Mm -hmm. Have you ever been given a script and you're looking at it and you're saying, this writer is an idiot. He doesn't get it. And then you turn around and rewrite it and make it better and make it like, okay, now I know what they're trying to say. And then you do at it least at, at, at least twice. I won't give you names. I won't okay. give you a okay. name, but at least twice I have gotten scripts that are like, this is just, this needs a page one rewrite. And it wow. sucks because that's not my job as an editor, yeah. but <clears throat> it's, and it's, it's never because it's always, there's always extenuating circumstances. Like obviously if I have a problem with a script as an editor, my job is to go to the writer and, ex and have a conversation and explain. But I remember in both of these cases, there were extenuating circumstances. I think one was that the script was so late that it mm -hmm. literally had to be drawn tomorrow and there was no time and I couldn't get them on the phone uh, or some, you know, stuff like that where there was just no, no way to get the work rewritten in time. So yeah, and that sucks, but it, you know, that is part of putting out the comics, man. They, they gotta come out whether you want them to or not. It's yeah, true. that's true. Yeah, uh, so Sean, uh, who owns Comics Elite, he's a publisher right now. Mm -hmm. He owns Artist Artist Elite Comics mm -hmm. and Merck Publishing, so he's learning that the hard way too. You know, sometimes you know it, they've got to come out. You know, got to make yep. donuts. Right, but the, um, but as an editor, I mean, but again, remember, as an editor, your job is to help them tell their story clearly and as best they can. Your job as an editor is never to tell them what to write. 
Mm. That's good advice. That's good. Yeah. It's That's just, great. It's, yeah. You know, you, if you're going to do that, then just write it yourself, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Does that make you a better writer? Just coming oh, at it from an editorial standpoint? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I remember I was an editor before I was a writer. I mm -hmm. was an editor at DC for a couple of years, mm -hmm. working on all their anthology books, working with every single writer in the industry from Neil Gaiman to Alan Moore to, you know, Archie Goodwin to Denny O'Neill to, I mean, every, literally everyone in comics. And at some point during those <laughs> years, I was an editor. Every one of those people had a script across my desk. And I learned so much about writing in those two years that it would have taken me 10 years to learn it on my own. Mm. Interesting. Um, so for you, what does the what does the future hold for you? Because clearly you're still bringing it home. You're, you're still amazing at it. Thank what, you. What, what does 2023 and on look like for you right now at this point? I, what a great question. I still got, you know, I've got a few things lined up at DC that we haven't announced yet. We haven't talked about. Um, there's, you know, and there's some other work, other places. If you, I can't, it's embargoed until Monday, but if you, if you look at social media on Monday, you'll see something else that I've done that you didn't know I did okay. that you'll be able to, uh, that, that has been a lot of fun. That's not really comics, okay. but oh, kind of is comics. Um, and look, I just want to keep pushing myself. I just want to keep trying to find new ways of doing this and new tools and new perspectives. And, you know, I can't get calcified into saying the same things over and over again or doing it the same way over and over again, because that's how you end up by the side of the road. Um, it's just fun for me. It's just fun for me. My favorite thing in the world is to go to the comic store and pick up something cool and see some new tool of storytelling or some new technique that had never occurred to me before mm -hmm. that I can add to my toolbox. I just, I love that. Very nice. Very yeah. nice. Yeah. So Kyle, Kyle's got a question. All, All right. right. I was going to save it to the end because okay. I know it probably annoys the hell out of you at this point, <laughs> but I had to bring up kingdom come. Yep. <laughs> Knew it was happening. Knew it was coming. <laughs> you probably know that every time somebody comes up to you and says, this is the greatest story in the world. I love it. It, it honestly, it, it really did. Like, you were the one that got me basically into comic books. You and Drew, Drew had it. I read it between you and Alex Ross. You, yeah, I was gonna say, don't let, don't leave Alex off that list, man. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, this was probably one of the first stories I ever remember reading cool. and actually enjoying and loving. So well, I'm glad. Does it? Uh, do you get the the fear that this is what you'll always be known for? Or does that bother you at all? Does that upset you? Like, ah, it's like Stephen King in the stand. It's yeah. Like... No, because I, I made my peace with it. That's what's going on my tombstone. Like, there's no, there's nothing I can do. I could save babies from a burning building tomorrow. And it wouldn't <laughs> matter. That's what, that's what I'd be known for is kingdom come. So you just lean into it. I mean, you know, that's okay. I mean, you know, other creative people have done things early in their career that, is you know that end up being like the things they're best known for it doesn't mean they can't keep doing work and bringing the thunder but look i you know it's better to be known for kingdom come than not to be known at all right that's a that, that's, that's a good that's outlook good to, to have yes. i mean yeah it really is i was just rereading it today i i, I reread this at least twice a year just because it's i just love it so much uh thank you i'm probably going to see you in baltimore i'm probably going to have you sign this by the way all right, just, great. <laughs> <laughs> just be prepared and by the way, I get your question. Like I went through, a, don't get me wrong. I went through a period where I was like, oh my God, is this all anybody's ever going to talk about about my work for the rest of my <laughs> yeah. life? Because I've done 2000 other comics. Yeah. But I've, you know, I managed to lean into it. At least it's, you know, it's not the only thing they talk about, which is nice. And speaking but, of that, you know, other things, uh, Tower of Babel. Mm -hmm. I remember Wizard Magazine, Batman was the villain of the year during <laughs> yeah. that run. Yep. Was that what you were aiming for? You know, like, no. Oh, like, oh. <laughs> you know, Batman was a circumstance, you know, it was caught up in his own circumstance. Um, you know, Batman made one bad judgment call and it yeah. wasn't keeping files on the Justice League. His, I will defend his decision to come up with a contingency plans against the Justice Leaguers. Where I will never defend him is that his mistake was in not telling them he was doing it. Not necessarily giving them all the details, but yeah. just mm -hmm. being honest with them and saying, because every single justice leader would have said, good call. I'm glad you're doing it. That is a smart thing for you to do. But to never tell them that was the mistake he made. 
That's what made them not trust him. Yeah, mm. that's fair. Yeah. yeah, I get that. So uh, we're going to wrap up. We're wrap, this is all we had um, yeah. with you today, Mark. We appreciate it. Um, is there anything uh, you want to talk about? Anything you want to push that we haven't brought up? That, I'm uh, thinking. We talked about World's Finest. We talked about uh, Batman versus Robin. Uh, we've got other things that we can't talk about right now. Um, I think that I think that sums it up really nicely. I mean, and we've there's a lot more of my work you're going to be seeing in the back half of the year. Terrific! I can't, can't cannot wait. wait. Yeah, I cannot wait. So, uh, everyone, thanks for tuning in. We appreciate it. And uh, Sean, I always say, uh, please remember to buy what you like, collect what you want, don't listen to the haters. And we'll see you guys again next time. Thanks, gentlemen.